yeah, Gene Bajlan, he's a uh, um, historian of Mideast history at uh, uh, Missouri State University. He is, as I said, a TMBS OG and a, this is a Revolution regular. He's also an unsung uh, literary hangover uh, research assistant. Um, uh, Gene Bajlan, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be with you guys. I'm. Uh, uh, it's a real honor. And uh, yeah, it was uh, quite a blast from the past having Black Pill Bessner on. Uh, <laughs> Black Pill Bessner, I love it. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm really glad to be here. I hope you guys are doing well. And uh, greetings from all the uh, uh, This Is Revolution crew to you all. We hope to have you guys over soon. And I, I see you have Restream, so I'm impressed. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, for now, who knows? What's we were trying to be little hipsters and do something different, but it's feeling like this might be the best way to go. Yeah, and uh, just to do a quick double plug, uh, Gene is actually uh, guesting on the American Prestige podcast doing a, a history of the Kurds. Is that right, Gene? Yeah, so uh, Danny invited me on with uh, Danny and Derek invited me on to talk about the Kurds. We actually planned to talk about the lead up to the First World War. Uh, but we ended up doing from about the 11th century to 1750. So we've had to do a, another a, a, another record where we managed to get to about 1890. So hopefully we'll get to the First World War at some point. But it's been really fun working with those guys. You know, the stuff Daniel is doing is really fantastic. He's building uh, an impressive American prestige uh industrial complex empire so i'm uh I, i'm and they do so much work i don't know how he has time uh in the day but uh he sh definitely should keep it up yeah yeah no i mean he's putting out a pretty impressive um amount of work but so are you i mean uh, i'm really excited to have you on to sort of help break down some of the recent events um in, in turkey i know matt had some some questions to sort of get you started on that but i feel like it's a part of the world that is is really crucial for people to understand one because of its role um, globally, uh, but also because it really is the site of a lot of interesting kind of left-wing and right-wing movements at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Turkey is pretty pivotal in uh, not only Middle Eastern history, but in world history in the sense that, for example, you know, these huge refugee flows heading towards Europe, which mm. have shaken up the European political order in, quite a profound way those are mediated through turkey turkey is a big player in syria turkey has been a big player in libya and of course turkey was heavily involved in the armenian azerbaijan conflict so you know turkey is obviously not a you know is not china or india but certainly it is an extremely influential country that occupies an important strategic position in the world uh simply because of its geopolitical, uh, because of its geographical organization. So, you know, what happens in Turkey has profound ripple effects, both westwards into Europe, but also uh, down across the Middle East, Central Asia, and places like that. So it's important to consider. And given the ongoing economic crisis, you know, the global capitalist system mm -hmm. is a house of cards. So you never know what kind of shock is going to send the whole thing into collapse. So it's perfectly possible that, you know, uh, continued economic crisis in Turkey could be some kind of trigger to a broader global crisis. Yeah, so we had you on four or five years ago now at this point um, to talk about the... Uh, Was it that FaceTime. long ago? Was it that I long think ago? so. Was it 20, maybe three? I think what, the FaceTime coup? The FaceTime, the FaceTime coup. coup. That was 2018, wasn't it? What's 2018? Okay. I, I, I could um, be wrong. I, I'm just shooting that out of the top of my head. So don't 2017, 2018, who knows? Yeah. Anyway. Um, but uh, so, and, and now uh, we have uh, Erdogan in, you, know, you mentioned the economic troubles. Give us a little overview of Erdogan. He's in the news a lot as a sort of, um, you know, authoritarian, mm -hmm. um, uh, anti-democratic. Uh, what's the, what's like the, um, I guess the understanding of that FaceTime coup now um, and uh, what has his what has he done since? And we I have this um, clip we can play later of uh, what I actually I'm just gonna put it up now. Um, this sure. is from uh, uh, when this is uh, October seventh, two thousand nineteen. Um, uh, Erdogan uh, actually this might be a, a later clip. I should have got these dates right. But anyway, this is uh, Erdogan in D.C. and it's a it's a com compilation of a bunch of clips um, on. 
uh, ordering like his security to go start a massive brawl. He's in the car there. And then the order goes out. Affirms it. They start attacking these Kurdish protesters. Pro Kurd protesters. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just give that to like set the table a little bit. Um, give us uh, your characterization of Erdogan. So uh, Erdogan is uh, a political opportunist in a general sense and has gone through different phases. He comes out of uh, the political Islam tradition in Turkey and, you know, that has a deep tradition on, on the political right. But generally before Erdogan came to power, that faction of the right, the, the, the Islamist right, and there are various gradations of that, were generally uh, kind of marginalized within the Turkish political order by the dominance of secular nationalist elites, the Kemalists, as they're called, and the military, which was extremely suspicious of, um, uh, of Islamist governments in 1997, for example, the Rafa party, which uh, came to power, was ousted by a kind of soft coup. And Akep Erdogan came out of that milieu and basically established this new Ar uh, party, AKP, which brought together uh, um, sort of some veteran politicians, but really presented itself as a kind of new, more moderate face of political Islam. They drew comparisons with Christian Democrats in Europe, and they came to power in uh, uh, 2002. They didn't have a huge popular vote, but due to the vagaries of the Turkish electoral system, they gained a massive majority in the uh, in the parliament. In fact, uh, even uh, uh, as their vote share went up over subsequent years, they, uh, they lost seats because of the nature of the Turkish political system. So they came into power with this kind of strong uh, uh, pos uh, position, and, if, uh, and their core of support basically lay in the provincial uh, petty bourgeoisie, uh, certain provincial elements of, of capital that had both politically and culturally felt excluded from the governing order in Turkey. So, so you know, the, the governing order in Turkey had been dominated by these secular coastal uh, elites that, uh, you know, ran the Starting show. Starting a little bit Trumpy. Yeah. And, well, <laughs> uh, in fact, this, uh, this was the first article Michael and I wrote together was the American AKP, which drew those uh, right. parallels. So, uh, and I actually think Turkey and America do have some, at least echoes, in terms of the way their politics, A, is, you know, is like dominated by right-wing forces that fight a sort of culture war rather than like a left-right, more traditional left-right division. But basically, uh, Erdogan comes to power with this core of uh, provincial petty bourgeoisie. Many of them had gotten rich with the, the neoliberal economic uh, transformations of the 1980s. You had this like new industrial sector growing in the provinces. And IKP brought this core together with other groups that were alienated by the existing political order, including the military and the Kemalist uh, elites, many of whom were, you know, state bureaucrats and, uh, and big capitalists in the, in, in the major cities. And so th there were, uh, you know, urban poor, many of whom had, you know, in recent times head to, to the city. But the coalition also brought in to, uh, a, a, an important element of Kurdish society that was alienated by the long uh, history of violence. Uh, AKP came in offering a kind of softer approach to the Kurdish question. Uh, uh, and uh, liberals who saw the primary threat to Turkish uh, democratization as the far right, the military, and those groups. So you have this sort of liberal phase of the AKP, which also benefited from uh, a kind of, uh, you know, there was an economic crisis in Turkey in the early 2000s. There was like an IMF plan. And we see this imposition of neoliberalism, uh, like neoliberal policies, but they're not pure 
neoliberal uh, policies in the sense that they have this kind of Clintonian uh, directed welfare, which of course benefits many of the poorest in society who had previously not had sort of any op opportunity to get any state benefit or any support from the state. And, and that helped consolidate support. So we have this like liberal phase uh, in the early uh, RKP uh, years, and very much that early phase was uh, was characterized, and I think this was a mistake that many liberals and even leftists made at the time, was uh, characterized by the RKP's sort of fight against the entrenched uh, state elites, the Derindevlete, the deep state, which is a term that has been used. I mean, I heard the term deep state used in Turkey extensively long before it became popular in America, but you had this deep state uh, where you have military far-right forces. You know, uh, uh, there was this famous car accident, Susuluk, where they had a, you know, where a far-right MP and like a kind of gang leaders were all organized crime were all in the same car together, kind of exposed this un, uh, infrastructure. So the IKP faced resistance from secular elites. There were big protests, for example, over the presidency when when uh, Erdogan's ally Abdullah Gül became president. Uh, there was opposition to that, and then of course things escalated with the beginning of um, uh, trials. Uh, and, and prosecutions against some of the uh, uh, old guard, old elite, these secular, these nationalists, military people, far right forces, this Ergenekon uh, trial, which was facilitated with the support of the Gulen movement, the Fethullah Gulen uh, movement, which is its own particular Islamic tradition, but you know was supportive at least in the early phases of the AKP. So there's this early phase. We have a kind of liberalizing political order. There is, you know, among some elements of society, some kind of optimism as well. We see the beginnings of a peace process with the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the, the hopes that, that that question might be uh, uh, put to bed. And sort of that liberal phrase carries on for a bit. But of course, over time, there's, there's a kind of, a, there's, there's growing opposition as, you know, economic growth is, uh, you know, isn't evenly distributed. The government becomes more uh, corrupt. Uh, there are corruption charges uh, and corruption uh, um, accusations against Erdogan and his family. And, you know, we gradually see the AKP move away from this liberal phase where we have Erdogan playing the role of being a Muslim modernizer. And in fact, in the aftermath of 9-11, you know, the Turkish model was this like alternative to, you know, Wahhabist or like Al-Qaeda type Islam. So there was also like a lot of good press there. There's a shift away from this to Erdogan becoming more and more authoritarian. And, you know, in the 2010s, there are several events that kind of cement this trajectory. I would say, you know, the Gezi protests, followed by um, the AKP's maneuvering following the fact in 2015 they lost their parliamentary majority. So Erdogan kind of did a bunch of political ma maneuvering, held another election to get back the majority. So basically refused to kind of accept the results. Uh, and then finally in 2016, we have in the summer of 2016, uh, uh, basically an attempted coup d'etat uh, you know, who exactly is responsible for that coup d'etat? It's like, I would not want to make any definitive statements on that, given the fact that, the, you know, the evidence we get out of Turkey is highly politicized. Um, and, you know, the judicial process is certainly problematic. So we have uh, this coup d'etat, but, you know, there are uh, clearly there were elements, including perhaps Gulenist supporting elements, whether with his connivance or whether autonomously, you know, at, you know, old Kamalists uh, seeing the writing on the wall, uh, because of course, you know, the the old elite was gradually being changed out. The longer the AKP is in power, you know, even within the military, you know, you're having a shift in the cadre who who are going up the ranks. So uh, the power of the Kamalists is declining, you know, ever seeping away slowly. So perhaps this was the last chance saloon for them. You have this coup, and then following this coup d'état. You have like basically a big intensification of uh, repression, uh, 
um, uh, assert, you know, uh, purging of state institutions, blacklisting of people, uh, you know, sh uh, change in the constitution to uh, under conditions of emergency martial law uh, to, to create a strong executive pre presidency and then growing imperial adventures overseas, in overseas including in um, uh, you know in, in Syria and Libya and Azerbaijan and a shift away from this initial kind of block with this which was built with the support of uh, liberals to basically bringing back uh, the hard right nationalists or at least factions of the hard right nationalists some of whom had been prosecuted in earlier uh, in the earlier phase of uh, al qaeda rule bringing those guys back and building a new kind of uh, political coalition which basically excludes the Kurds and relied increasingly on uh, the hard right, uh, uh, pers you know, personified by Devlet Bacheli and the uh, National Action Party, the kind of fascistic uh, grey wolf wing. So I, I, Erdogan basically does a kind of vault fast in his political orientation. So we see him playing the kind of liberal modernizer in the first part and then with the collapse of that. So he plays the Obama and the Trump, if you want to use it in America, Ross. He plays both those roles in Turkey. But of course, uh, he does it, you know, far more, he does his Trump turn far more effectively uh, because he's uh, a relatively, you know, he, uh, you know, the, the system in Turkey is uh, more centralized and relatively easier for him to dominate. So I hope but, that sums it up. No, I mean, it certainly does. And I mean, um, I, I hate to ask you another kind of broad question um, in addition to that, but just to help people who might not be, um, you know, to understand the kind of internal, internal uh, dynamics in, in Turkey. What is it like, um, you know, both sort of politically and I don't know, like your day to day experience potentially for like the average kind of working class, particularly like younger Turkish person? I mean, what is the state for the vast majority of, of, of people who work for a living in the country of Turkey right now? Well, now it's pretty dire. Like you're having huge inflation problems, uh, major uh, mismanagement. And, you know, there's all kinds of like tragic stories coming out of Turkey with, you know, young people feeling hopeless about the future, about their job prospects. There was recently a like a, a young boy who killed himself, uh, you know, because of these like increasingly differ, different, uh, difficult social conditions. And, you know, young people are like increasingly angry uh, at a system which is mm. both uh, nepotistic, increasingly nepotistic, um, and in, in, in which their prospects for the future look more and more dire because you know the economic fortunes of the country are, seem to be in a kind of terminal decline uh, and at the same time you have this uh you know political elite that is clearly you know enjoying you know they they they're clearly making money in this situation you know they're the ones who know about the interest rates so they can do the currency speculation Mm, just the like Pelosi who, here, you know. <laughs> right, they're the ones who have the uh, the good context to get jobs, but if you don't have the context, you're excluded. So it's but, a it's, so, it's a dire situation for many. But at at, at the same time, um, you know, I'm just asking: um, is there among, especially like younger people, people who are looking, you know, for ways out, a, a kind of, you know. Wherever you see systems like that, there are always people who say, okay, well, if the power's in the state, if it's centralized, I need to find a way to get into the room, right? I mean, is there any kind of movement of youth in support of, of Erdogan that you would sort of note as, as sizable or notable? Or is it, uh, you know, more across the board sort of disgust and, and, and disappointment in general? That's a good question. Like, I wouldn't want to make any super strong statements. Yeah, yeah. Because, of because course, and I'm not trying to put you in that spot. Yeah, because I haven't been, I haven't been to uh, Turkey in a couple of years. So, uh, like, I don't have. I wouldn't say I have like an ear on the on the ground of like what scuttlebug is and what mm. you're hearing. But from like Turkish social media, from uh, um, uh, you know, from uh, uh, you know. Uh, like other like academic sources and things like that, or people who I who I talk to who are from Turkey, uh, you know the the sort of thing is that I think there's a kind of hopelessness. You know, mm -hmm. the AKP, for example, has you know they have a youth wing, 
Uh, they try to do these like social media campaigns and things like that, but they fall flat. You know, the the mm -hmm. gens the Gen Z seem pretty cynical uh, about the uh, uh, prospects of, of the future. Um, there's you know there's still very strong Turkish nationalism amongst Turkish elements uh, of society, but like that doesn't sort of rally necessarily behind Erdogan. And in fact, one of the th uh, things about the opposition, you know, the opposition also includes hard right elements, mm -hmm. such as the E party, which was a split from the National Action Party. So the National Action Party, the MHP, which is this fascist party that uh, Erdogan relies for, for support, um, that party split and the kind of anti AKP faction is in the opposition. Uh, so, um, you know, there are hard, you know, some of this uh, opposition is taking a kind of hard right uh, um, sort of uh, stance. Uh, amongst Kurdish youth, uh, there, for example, there was uh, an enormous amount of social protest in 2014, 2015 as well, hugely radicalized uh, uh, youth. I mean, again, you know, there was these huge battles which destroyed, you know, many of the Kurdish majority cities and you know the PKK is you know blamed for that but my my tendency to is to think that the PKK weren't they were following the lead of the radicalized youth uh, mm. and sort of backing their revolt so as to not lose control of o, over the radicalized youth as well so you basically have a situation where uh, you know you have an opposition which to a certain degree at the moment is coalescing because of the economic crisis, but they're like very deep fissures in it. And one of the fundamental contradictions of the opposition is that uh, it hasn't managed to resolve, uh, you know, the, the, the Kurdish question in a sense that they, the HDP, which was the, you know, the Kurdish pro Kurdish party, but in about 2014, 2015 began to present itself less as a Kurdish party and more of a kind of Syriza Corbyn labor general mm. front for the left. That wing of the left has been suppressed. So what are you left with in, in the opposition? You have a kind of milk toast kind of, uh, let's say reformed Kemalists like, uh, uh in the, uh, JHP, the, the, uh, uh Halk party, which is the main, inverted commas, Kemalist uh, opposition, uh, which has kind of tried to moderate itself. It has popular a popular mayor in Istanbul, a, po a popular mayor in Ankara. They won these uh, local elections. Uh, but it's kind of a milk, it's a milk toast, ne you know, neoliberal uh, kind of social democratic uh, posing party. Then you have a, a hard right uh, fascistic Turkic, uh, Turkish nationalist party, but that is anti AKP, and then you have like these former AKP uh, ministers, uh, including uh, former Prime Minister Davutoglu, with their small um, kind of liberal Islamist political parties, uh, creating like this opposition. So even if by hook or by crook this opposition could win power. You know, they're like very divided in many ways, and they don't really have a pro program that could address some of the like fundamental economic and political uh, uh, um, po uh, problems facing Turkey and the radical left, which had coalesced around the HDPs, which, you know, the core were Kurdish voters, uh, but, you know, it attracted just general sort of left orientated people across the uh, country. And that uh, that that movement has been uh, suppressed through all kinds of legal mechanisms, election results. Uh, uh, you know, uh, elected officials have been purged and replaced by appointed officials in local governments. MPs have been arrested. The leaders have been arrested. So the movement, that's a kind of constitutional leftist movement, has been eliminated to a large degree from the field, although it's still contesting elections. And then you have this opposition. But my general feeling is that, you know, they won't abolish elections in Turkey, but I'm sure Erdogan will find some kind of way to stay in power. Erdogan did a Putin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, I guess it's a silver lining that he doesn't have a, <clears throat> there's not a turning points APK uh, uh, to kind of rouse up the um, the youngsters there. Um, they do have a, they do have like huge uh, social media troll armies that, uh, that like harass people. And there were always these kind of campaigns against people. And there's like all kinds of things. Like, for example, there was a Turkish tra- fashion designer who uh, criticized the AKP on uh, Twitter and mysteriously a group of 12 men broke onto the uh, the runway at Atatürk uh, airport and beat him up while he was getting onto a plane. Wonder how that hmm. happened. So, you know, there's this yeah. kind of like increasing gangsterism and, and, and mob uh, rule uh, uh, taking place. I mean, and you yeah. see it, you know, even coming here, which is a, a huge thing, um, you know, to see people in D.C. getting beat up. I mean, that was that was something else. Not that D.C. is some kind of holy city, but that's that kind of violence very rarely Those balls. reveals itself in the U.S. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that kind of brings us to uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you was this Ennis uh, Freedom, Ennis Cantor situation. <laughs> and we covered Ennis uh, on TMBS uh, because he got on the wrong end of, uh, of, of Erdogan. He sent some, you know, uh, taking a bit of a turn, uh, getting meetings with a lot of like State Department people, that sort of thing. Um, and I wanted to get your opinion on that because I, I, I must say I – I feel a little bit bad for how hard I've I've went at Enos because I look back at it and he's like a thirty year old something basketball player who's been through stuff and like I, I I don't know if he's just a dumb guy like it, caught up in stuff and being used for the other for for like his propaganda value but give us the context for Enos Cantor and Gulan Fatula Gulan and Gulanism and what your uh, take on like Cantor is but also give us people the Gulan uh, context. Yeah, so Gulen is this religious leader in Turkey. He has his own uh, brand. Of, well, he's not in Turkey. He's in Pennsylvania now. And he's been in exile since the late 1990s. And, um, yeah, he comes out of this sort of... He comes out of the Nurju movement, which is uh, which was led by Saeed Kurdi, who was a like Islamic reformer in the early 20th century, who became... A kind of big critique of like a, a big anti-materialist, if that makes sense. He was like, we gotta, we gotta have like an anti-materialist uh, 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 view of the world, and focus not so much on seizing power directly, but working through uh, in society through informal networks. And 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 Fatullah Gulen comes out of that school, and he developed this movement. The the they call you know they said Gulen movement, but like. The Gulen is called the Hizmet, which is a service movement. And, you know, they had clubs and all kinds of, like, businesses, schools, uh, a lot of civil society type organizations. They also had enormous missionary work around the world. They established schools in Africa and in, in across the Middle East, Central Asia, Philippines. Mm. The, they're even involved in charter schools in the United States. So the Gulen movement has its... T- fingers in a lot of pies but it's not like a central organization in which you have like uh, a clear con- command and control there's no like executive board um Gulen is like this kind of reclusive religious figure who's uh, sitting at uh, you know sitting in pennsylvania in a compound uh, and then you have all these like uh, different um sort of forms of activity which is are funded by you know contributions and business people, and this group was like very uh, was to like very successful. It can, it, it was in alliance with Erdogan's movement, which you know comes out of a different branch of Islamism. Uh, it, it it infiltrated state institutions. There were all these cases where they you know Gulenists were Gulenists in the police force were assisting. Uh, you know, students in taking their examinations and, mm. and and that kind of stuff. So they did this kind of state infiltration, and many of the kind of uh, documents, leaked documents against the Kemalists during the early phases of AKP rule were leaked by Gulenists working inside the state. So they had this kind of like, they had this kind of infiltration uh, operation uh, taking place, and then they tried to turn that on Erdogan. They, they, you know, they were involved in in the uh, in highlighting a corruption scandal where he's like on the phone talking about moving the money, and um, yeah, well, 
they did not, you know, they thought they were the player, but they got played because, you know, you can have a big civil society organization, but you know what's better than that? State power. And, <laughs> and uh, they got the hammer on them, right? Mm -hmm. And then when this coup, you know, and the hammer had been going down for a while, you know, and the hammer went down hard, you know, it went down hard. And then after the coup, it went down super hard. And, you know, you like have tons of people who are just caught up in this, you know, caught up in this, it's like a, a big movement. Uh, uh, and not every, you know, not everybody was at the same level of like involvement. This was like, these were people who were just sort of pious Muslims or engaging in what they saw, or, you know, like doing education mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But basically uh, association with any kind of Gulenist institution has become a, uh, a raison d'etre to be purged from uh, uh, your job, to be blacklisted, to be forced out of the country. Uh, you know, some people have like, uh, and you know, like maybe some of these charges are true, you know, you know, maybe some of these people did conspire to do sort of illegal activities, but you know, the, the sheer kind of just general sweep which include, you know, like primary school teachers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, right. uh, these kind of things. These, you know, the, it, it's just like really big. So like Fethullah Gulen went from being like a friend of the regime. Uh, there are, you know, there are pictures with um, Erdogan and Gulen together uh, to being public enemy number one, where uh, if you're critical of the government, you know, one of the accusations they'll throw at you is that you're a Feto. Jew, you're a, you're a follower of Fatou de Gulen, and you know uh, mm. it's it's basically the kind of like in, enemy, internal enemy. So you have you have like Fatou de Gulen playing this role as a as a boogeyman, uh, and you know basically Anas Kanter has kind of been caught up in that, right? And you know, like I don't have like I feel sorry for the average Fatou de Gulen follower, but you know the movement itself was not like this goody two shoes movement that they try and present themselves like they you know they they had these kind of dodgy political ambitions they did forge documents they did kind of uh uh you know knocking on people to the uh, state and things like that they played the game and then they're going play. for it yeah, yeah they were go they were going for it too so but they got they got beat because state power wins out in the end and this huge purge took place and the the coup just accelerated that purge to epic, uh, epic proportions and provided an excuse for the Turkish state to further kind of uh, not get rid of democracy, but, you know, clamp down on uh, sort of the ability, or, you know, clamp down, you know, basically destroy people's livelihoods so they can't function in the system. Mm -hmm. So what's the, how much, uh, uh, what's the outlook for like Erdogan and uh uh how much uh, can he stay in the trump mode for a while or does he have to shift to after being uh, um both go ahead david no and i was i was just saying and as an addition to that i mean um i i know that there is some kind of grandstanding that you get from american politicians about mm -hmm. him um but do you think that there is any kind of real desire for example within the Biden administration or powers that be to sort of see him go away or See, I known, would, known, you know, known uh, enemy. So, like, in terms of the U.S. foreign policy establishment, like, people are certainly um, not that sweet on Erdogan. There is, there are fears. At least I've, I've heard sort of foreign policy analysis people uh, fearing about what a post Erdogan Turkey might look look like because, you know, one of the strengths Turkey historically had is that even though it was a th an authoritarian. Uh, state they had relatively strong institutions like the military and the judiciary and things like that um but Erdogan has like kind of uh, hollowed out a lot of that stuff and and increasingly turned Turkey into a one party uh, one man rule state where things revolve around his personality so I've heard some foreign policy people worry about you know Erdogan's bad but like if he collapses and Turkey ends up in a kind of low, even a low intensity civil war you're going to have like millions of people just like taking advantage of that and scooting to uh, scooting to Europe. Um, in terms of, uh, and, uh, and actually there are also right wing, uh, particularly right wing think tanks uh, uh, and right wing foreign policy people who are like very much in favor of um, 
supporting Erdogan. The Erdogan, Erdogan throws, you know, his people throw a bit of money around DC. You know, you can buy yourself a right wing person such as, you know, for example, General Flynn, who was paid for, uh, you know, wrote a, a op-ed in the Hill, you know, saying that we needed to support Turkey in its war against terrorism against uh, Fethullah Gulen. Uh, so you have some right wing factions. Trump, uh, his evangelical base doesn't like Erdogan for a mm. whole variety of different reasons, um, but uh, like a lot of the people around him, and including Trump, if you read his, you know, if you if you read some of the uh, accounts of. Uh, his opinions. He was like pretty impressed with Erdogan for doing like for being a. You know, Erdogan has big rallies. He knows how to do that kind of <laughs> stuff. He was, you know, that's not. It's, Erdogan knew how to play Trump. You know, mm -hmm. like he knew how to he knew how to play. Him. Oh yeah. The Biden administration, I think there is like kind of bad blood there, uh, but you know, and they would probably like uh, to see Erdogan go, but you know, Turkey is, you know, it's a major partner the europeans might not like turkey but you know the germans still were selling weapons to them you know they mm -hmm. the, they still the eu still pays them off to stop the syrians coming yeah, as well to uh, say you know it's a it's a physical barrier for them too so he's so he's he's uh he's got a pretty strong international uh position he's like playing off the united states and russia against mm -hmm. each other sometimes he's aligning more with the united states sometimes he's aligning with russia uh, some, uh, but he's playing. He's he's he, like he's using this kind of strategic autonomy that Turkey possesses because of its geopolitical location um, to, you know, extract uh, concessions from uh, major powers and avoid the punishments that a country like Iran would mm -hmm. be, uh, uh, you know, be it'd be, um, uh, uh, be, you know, be substitute if they did the same kind of thing. Can you imagine if the Iranians, what well, people, the eggs people would lay if the Iranians were sending troops to Libya and Azerbaijan? You know, so the you have this, uh, you have this, um, you, you have, uh, and there are some like serious bones of contention. There's this uh, legal case, uh, the Halk Bank case, which is like something Erdogan really wants to go away to do with all kind of sanction busting stuff with Iran. But you know Erdogan's playing the, playing playing this game, and he's using the fact that he plays this game to kind of present himself as an anti-imperialist. Mm. Uh, one of the weirdest parts of his new coalition is that he has like this guy called Dol Perenchik on his side, who's a, who's a, a former Maoist, and who's now like uh, he has like a like this weird a, a Maoist ultra secularist who is now presenting a kind of he's he's kind of like a I mean to what the he's kind of like a nazbol if that makes sense to people mm. he's kind of like one of these uh eurasianists who's like he's like big into china and he's like turkey needs to be in this eurasian uh this eurasian block so you have these like kind of weird constellations uh coming into being i i follow that newspaper uh the newspaper idyllic which is the newspaper of this like former maoist organization uh, like and it's like the headlines are like it's like a weird combination. It's like a weird anti-imperialist language, but in service of Erdogan and the Erdogan uh, regime, which of course is, is just a fucking timpa capitalist regime. And mm. uh, Erdogan is like sh he shifted a little bit away from the old uh, kind of World Bank uh, uh, economic policy to like a little bit more state capitalist kind of nonsense. But it's a big old. It's a it, it's like a there's a kind of malaise in Turkey, but Erdogan still has, you know, control. Maybe he'll get second die. Maybe something will have, have that. I am like, there's a lot of talk these days that about Erdogan in his twilight right now. And while the regime does seem to be like increasingly unpopular and brittle, I'm, I'm A, I'm not sure that the opposition can necessarily coalesce. And B, I am pretty skeptical and I could be persuaded that like you're going to have a normal kind of election situation where because mm -hmm. you don't have to rig an entire election you just need to do a, like selective kind mm -hmm. of gerrymandering and because of the nature of the turkish system they they might be able to pull it out of the bag so i'm like very concerned that you know we go to an election 
And then if it looks like AKP has lost and uh, and things like that, it there could be you know it could be serious serious uh, trouble. Although like opinion polls seem to show that some uh, there are some potential presidential candidates who could definitely beat Erdogan. But mm -hmm. the problem is, are they going to play? You know, is Erdogan going to like play the game where he like just fuels? divisions within the opposition so they cannibalize each other because they're like pretty incoherent as well mm -hmm. so like i'm very like concerned about the future like you know lots of people are kind of suffering in, in, in turkey now uh the kind of securitization and violence of the state is becoming you know it happens i like you know the way i think of it is like look you know, all these kind of like police measures and this kind of uh political gerrymandering and a legal kind of lawfare removal of democratically elected people. They all pioneered that shit in the Kurdish regions against the HDP, against the radical left. Now, more and more, it's looking like they're going to deploy that kind of stuff amongst the, uh, the um, uh, you know, in the kind of like Turkish areas, which had hitherto not been subject to that kind of thing. In Turkey, and this is a kind of like historical thing, the road to autocracy leads through Kurdistan, you know, mm. starts there and then, you know, heads to, you know, and, and those kind of things head to the uh, um, capital. When the, in the, uh, when the Republic was founded, the big Kurdish uprising, which was suppressed by the Kemalist, was the excuse to have a general purge of Turkish politics and these independent tribunals. So this is this is a pattern that repeats. What they do to the Kurds will be done to other elements mm. of the opposition when the time comes. Well, Gene, I mean, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and I, I feel like that was very helpful. There's definitely a lot more um, that we could be getting into, but were you still planning to hang out with us for a little bit in the post game or? Sure. More than happy All to. Right. It's great to talk with you guys. Well, well, great. Well, we're going to, we have one more segment before we go there, but we'll let Gene go so we can take a quick break. I'll, I'll text you. I'll probably get on around nine our time. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, Gene will be in there for the post game. And again, you know, a little plug will be taking a voicemail. So get those in as well. Check out. Oh, yeah, Gene's they're actually one there's one already in there so if there's you some already waiting for us there so get those in uh, we put the number up on the patreon for people to be able to uh to call in uh, but definitely can check I, out jeans yeah yeah get go can ahead I plug something yeah absolutely so, that's what i was getting into so i just want to say you know people should check out this is revolution of course but also i would like to say jason has done we're getting into the video essay game and mm -hmm. J J jason miles has written a video essay on the decline of uh uh punk punk and neoliberal politics in the in the 90s so he's done a video essay on that we have a couple of other so we have a, a two-part series on lenin and a couple other things in the go so uh check those out if you have the time and please if you're not a subscriber to this is revolution please do it we're trying to get to ten thousand, you know oh, yeah. by march you know hit Hell that yeah. no, number where are that now we're at like i guess we're at like i don't know like seven thousand. Oh, yeah, uh, we seven, we've been we've been it's been it went fast and then it's been like it's been pulling teeth and uh pascal keeps checking every day so if you don't want pascal's <laughs> heart to, to sink <laughs> give us do a it subscribe. for our man do it for pascal 